Thank you all for coming to uh, this Made in Japan event at the Center for Computing History. This evening, we've got a, a kind of two-part talk. Uh, Quang's going to talk to us initially about these wonderful things here, his, uh, his mini Game Boys and his experiences as a Game Boy developer. Uh, and then once we've done that, we're, we'll take a short break and then we're just going to have a, a talk about Japanese machines in, in general and Quang's experiences of collecting many, many, many of them. All of them. All of them. All of them? Every single one? Nearly. Okay. Nearly there. Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over now to Quang and uh, enjoy. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Quang. Uh, this is my talk about Game Boy. <coughs> How nostalgic is that? <laughs> that, that, that sound? This is. Uh, yeah, I must have got my Game Boy. What's a wee lad? All right, let's start up. So, um, very cursory, um, for those of you who don't know what a Game Boy is, uh, Game Boy is this handheld that came out here. Uh, it's known as the DMG1, came out in 1989, so it is 30 years old this year. Blimey. Almost as old as me, not quite. <laughs> um, so, yeah. The Game Boy, known as the DMG1, got, was followed up in 1996. Look at the difference in time. That's quite a big jump in years before they've said, you know what, we should improve this because uh, it's going to be a long in the tooth. Uh, I'm sure you all know the Atari Lynx and the Atari Game Gear came out. Uh, the Lynx is exactly the same year and the, the Game Gear the year after. And also Turbo Express were all color consoles, amazing consoles, but battery life was horrendous. And um, yeah, the Game Boy kind of won out that war. Uh, the Game Boy Pocket came out in 1996, slightly smaller, let, took two double eight, two triple A batteries and a much better screen so it didn't blur as much as that one did. Uh, followed in by the Game Boy Light. Uh, this was a Japanese only console. Um, I have a bunch of Game Boy Lights at the front here. Uh, they are like the Game Boy Pocket but with a backlight, a electroluminescent backlight. So if everyone had one of those uh, Casio, what do they call them? Indiglo, yeah. Indiglo watches. So it's Sentec used in that. Um, and that was 1998, uh, and then a little further on in the year, they reached the Game Boy Color. So this is very similar to the, the original Game Boy, but it's twice as fast, uh, has a color screen. Um, still very difficult to see the screen because it's not back backlit, but still backwards compatible um, and played all the same games. So uh, going back to 1989, we're now 1998. <laughs> so uh, this many years later, I can't add up, but my math's not working. Um, they're still making 8-bit consoles. It's an 8-bit console. You know, by, by now, <laughs> the, the PlayStation era is coming out. Am I right? 98? Mm -hmm. That sounds about right? Yeah, 96, 97, 98. So actually past the PlayStation era. Uh, followed up by the Game Boy Advance. It's a 16-bit console, um, but 100% compatible with the older titles. Uh, it has a CPU in there that lets you play the old Game Boy games as well. This was followed up by the Advance SP, the other 41, with a, with a Front lit screen. Uh, there is an updated version called the AGS 101, which is, has a backlight screen. So if you ever want a Game Boy to play Game Boy games, this is the best version to get it. The AGS 101 it has a backlit screen, looks wonderful, um, very portable, nice form factor. Uh, they did make one more Game Boy, uh, the Game Boy Micro, Micro uh, which is the smallest Game Boy, but ironically, is the biggest picture uh, of all the slides. <laughs> uh, the Game Boy Micro, as much as I love this little thing, it doesn't play uh, old DMG and Game Boy Color games natively. Uh, there are ways to do it, but natively it doesn't work. So um, it's a lovely console. All right, so that's what the console was. That's in 2005. So the last uh, AGS was 2005. So you think about the first console being in um, 1989, all the way to 2005. That's a long lifespan to be playing Game Boy games. That's how awesome it was. <laughs> is, was, still is. Hmm. All right, so uh, on launch in Japan, the first four games that came out for it were the Super Mario Land, Alleyway, Baseball, and Yaku Man. Who's got Yaku Man? <laughs> Disappointed in all of you. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Yaku Man was a Japanese release, it's a Mahjong game. I don't know if anyone here has it. I don't have it myself, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, on my game, my Game Boy, uh, I had Super Mario Land. That's one of my first games. And the very last game that was made for the Game Boy, uh, for the Game of Color, was the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets in 2002. 
just again, I'm just emphasizing how long this lifespan of this console was. Um, I think only the PS2 now beats it, or it's on par with PS2 mm. in terms of the lifespan. I didn't fact check that before I did this talk. <laughs> Probably should have done that. Anyway, onwards. So, quick specifications. Again, you, everyone here has a Game Boy. Everyone should know what Game Boy is. Uh, it has a CPU. It's an 8-bit uh, sharp LR35902, um, which just rolls off the tongue. Uh, <laughs> I know when I was growing up, I, I was told it's basically a Z80 modified, but to be honest, it's not even that. It's more like an 8080, uh, which was used in the Altair and a few other really old computers, um, plus a few more instructions, minus a few from the Z80. So it's somewhere in between a Z80 and an 8080. And for those of you who don't know, the Z80 CPU was used in many 8-bit computers, including the Sinclair Spectrum. And basically anything that didn't have a 6502 pretty much had a Z80 in it. Yeah. Uh, the screen itself, there's a 2.6 inch LCD screen, uh, 160 pixels by 144 pixels. High res stuff. <laughs> uh, it gives you a, a PPI of 82.79, which is more than your Nokia 3210, but not more than your average smartphone now. Uh, and it came in four lovely shades of gray. I say shades of gray, it's more like green puke, really, to, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but the, the Game Boy Pocket, the, it, 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 they converted that to grey and that's much, much nicer. The sound chip itself uh, has four it's a four-channel sound, very similar to the NES. Uh, two pulse waves, one sample wave and a noise generator. Uh, what it had over the NES is it had stereo sound. Uh, the NES couldn't play one channel. Uh, the Game Boy itself only has one speaker, but if you put, plug some he headphone, headphones? headphones in, um, you can hear the stereo sound. Uh, and control-wise, it's got an eight-way D-pad, and four buttons. So nice and simple. Uh, none of your 16 buttons with dual analog shock stuff. Uh, it's too much now. Uh, that's a keep, keep it simple. Um, the graphics system itself uh, is a tile-based system. So for those of you who don't know, um, everything on the screen is made up of a tile. Uh, these are these tiles, eight by eight pixels, uh, done in the four colors. So the 160 by 144 resolution. Uh, breaks down to 20 by 18 tiles. Um, so you can't draw a straight line on the screen directly. You have to convert each tile to be part of that line. So it's a little more complicated than just drawing a straight line. Um, if you want to write some text, there's no text routines. You have to make your own text routines. You have to, each tile has to be a letter and then you have to assign the sprites and so forth. It's a bit more complicated than people think it is. People are like, oh, why can't you just draw a line? It's not like uh, also <laughs> explains why there weren't many 3D games out on the Game Boy, although there were some. So some people didn't manage it, and I uh, probably can show you some of them later. Uh, the background map itself, oh sorry, sprites. Uh, yeah, sprites. So uh, along with the tile-based background, uh, it had 40 sprites that could overlay it and go be anywhere they like. Uh, if you're familiar with the Commodore 64, it has sprites that can overlay the background in a higher res if need be. Um, these were 40 sprites, uh, either 8 by 8 pixels, uh, so one tile size, or eight by 16, so slightly taller, uh, one by two tiles. Uh, all sprites had to be the same size, so either had all eight by eight or all eight by 16. And then I said, that, yeah, the background map was, even though the window's only 20 by 18, the background map itself is 32 by 32. So what you actually see is like a window port into the background. And above that, you have a window uh, layer, which goes on top of that, which is also 32 by 32. That will get all a bit more uh, clear as I go along. Um, so that's the Game Boy. Uh, are we all up to speed on the Game Boy? Do we all know what a Game Boy is? <laughs> Great stuff. So this is me. Um, I'm a Sobi Tech. Um, it's me and my brother. These are the social media stuff. It's all a Sobi Tech. Uh, easy to find, but it's fine. All right. Um, I started this oh, 11 years ago now. Yeah, I started Subtech 11 years ago. Um, start making games again. Uh, obviously, if you think about Game Boy stuff, it was 20 years ago. There was a nine year gap when I didn't make any games. Uh, and I started Subtech. Uh, I came over as a refugee in 1979 uh, with my. Older brother, my mum and dad, my younger brother is actually born here in, here in Glasgow. Um, and we came over with pretty much nothing. Um, 
but I didn't stop my dad and my mum. They worked really hard and gave us all these cool stuff. Uh, they got me a Sinclair Spectrum Plus 2. That was my first computer. <laughs> Uh, we did have friends who had a, uh, had a 48k rubber keyboard and stuff like that, and I, I was adored it. I remember the first game I played was probably Jetpack, and it, it's a lasting impression. If you ever played Jetpack, you, you know how amazing a game it is. It's, it's incredible. And you think about it, it's made in 16k. It's, it's, uh, at the time, there was nothing like it. Um, nothing moved as fast or as fluid as Jetpack. So I got my Plus 2, I got the manual, and um, read the manual back to front. Over and over again. I didn't understand a lot of it, to be honest. But I did do a lot of typing listings, and um, I learned basic over time. Uh, you, at the time, you would go to a library, um, and you would get books out, and uh, there'd be typing listings in there, and you would type them all in, and something would happen. Uh, and the more you did this, the more you started to understand what the code words mean and what things happen. Uh, you would get magazines, and in, in the magazine listings, they would show um, had to make games. You type them all in and something would happen, but then it will crash because they made a mistake and then you had to wait the next month for them to post the, the, <laughs> the, the, the mendum saying, sorry, how bad, we did this wrong. But you know, if you were smart enough, you could work out what actually went wrong and you work out what was the bit that should have changed. Uh, so that was followed by an Atari ST. Um, we, got, we went up to 16 bits. Um, I convinced my dad to get one because for schoolwork. We got, we got the business pack, we got the word processor, we got the spreadsheet, the printer, <laughs> everything. Um, we play games, um, but we went to the store once and we got Stoss the Game Creator. And this blew my mind. This was incredible. Stoss, Stoss is, uh, again, it's, it's in basic, but it allows you to do sprites, colors, graphics, music, sound, and you could actually make like proper games. Yes, you can make games in, in such and basic, but I'm sure you've all played those games and they're basic to say the least. But Stoss actually you make commercial grade games with it. Um, uh, that opened the world to me. Uh, in 1989, CVG magazine ran this article. This article showed the future of handheld gaming, the Game Boy. Um, and I've always had a crazy obsession with small portable electronics. And the Game Boy it's just inspired me. I actually literally cut this. Game Boy out the magazine, mounted onto the cardboard, and walked around with a cardboard Game Boy. <laughs> um, it was just, yeah, so July 99. My dad, that year, my dad went to America, um, my, my mum and dad went to America, um, and it was my birthday in the month after, and I begged my dad to get me one of these, because they'd just been released in America. Um, he did. Oh, hey. <laughs> Uh, this is, unfortunately isn't my original original Game Boy. My original original Game Boy got sold on and given away to someone else. Uh, I never saw that again. But I managed to get a new one with everything, the headphones and the screen cable and all the manual stuff. Um, but yeah, so uh, thanks to my dad, I managed to get a Game Boy. Um, and I took this thing with me everywhere. Uh, school every single day. Uh, I dropped it a few times, but they're made like tanks. And, and, and it just kept chugging along and kept working. Uh, I even managed to convince my math teacher to let me play Tetris in class. I said, look, it's shapes, it's geom geometry, it's all this stuff. Um, if we do a mass investigation in it, you can, we can play Tetris, can't we? Yes, we can. So yeah, <laughs> spent many hours playing Tetris in class. Uh, so moving on, um, I went to college, um, did my A-levels in computing, and we learned Turbo Pascal. By then, we had upgraded to a 486 laptop in color. Our previous laptop was a black and white one, uh, 286, I believe. Um, but then we started programming, and uh, Pascal, I really like Pascal. Um, it's, it's, it's procedural, and it's very straightforward, and it does what it says on the tin. Uh, and we made a few games on that. Uh, then I went to university, and my dad bought me a Gateway 2000 Pentium 2 266. Ooh. Oh, that was something <laughs> else. Um, my college uh, tutor at the time said, if you understand Pascal well enough, you may as well be learning C. Because um, it's very similar in, in many, many ways. Um, so in my spare time, I would go home and learn C. Uh, there was a freeware C assembler called C compiler called DJ GPP. And that's written in ANSI C. Uh, obviously nowadays people use C++ and Turbo C and I don't know what other ones, Super C and I'm, I'm making them all up now. <laughs> Ultra C, yeah, Ultra C64. That's, that's the one. That's the one they use. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so you can see my, my programming skills are now uh, evolving. Uh, I'm like, almost like a Digimon. <laughs> um, at this, it's about the gateway and the cow print. Does it, people remember those? Yeah. Mm. The, the boxes that came in? Yeah. I, I really wanted to get some uh, cow print stencils to stick it on the side of the, 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 the computer. <laughs> and just, uh, just that, I think they were missing a trick there. Just <laughs> cow computers, that would be good. Uh, sorry, I'm waffling now. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, nine eight eight. The game with color came out. Um, so I, I picked one of those up pretty much on on launch because uh, I was enamored with my Game Boy. And to be, to hear that as a color one came out, it's like gotta have that. Um, by then I was making some money. Um, I managed to save enough pennies to get one of those. Um, and then there was a company called Lixang, uh, who did lots of imports uh, back then. And they became uh, they had a bit of a ruckus with Sony and went out of business. And they kind of Transition became Bung, uh, and Bung uh, made these flash carts. So this is the one of the first flash carts for the Game Boy, which allowed you to put your ROMs onto them and then play them on the Game Boy itself. Um, uh, I'm going to segue actually. Hold on. Um, slight segue. So this is 1998. Uh, I had started uni in '96. Uh, and in uni, uh, one of the things in uni we had was uh, a computer center, and they allowed you to make a website on your computer space. Uh, they gave us a whole 10 megabytes to make a website. Which back then was tons, you know. I think GeoCities gave you 10 meg as well. Um, we had GeoCities website. Yeah, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so not only was there was this 10 meg space you were given, but you were also given this scratch space on the Z drive which was pretty much infinite. I don't know how big it was, but just I never managed to fill it. It was just scratch space. Um, I worked out how to make a symbolic link from my 10 meg web space into <laughs> the scratch space. So my website was infinite in space now. Although they did wipe it once a month. So I worked out what day they wiped it on, got a zip drive, backed up the, drive, the, 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 <laughs> the website with the zip drive, wait, wait for the midnight, they wiped it, put it back in, reloaded it. So it was down for maybe half an hour at the most. So uh, this was quite a, an ingenious way to get an unlimited size, size website. So I don't know if you remember back then, universities were the only places that had T1 internet connections, where we, everyone else was on dial-up. Uh, maybe 80s or by then, 96? No, maybe not. Maybe, yeah. maybe yeah. still dial-up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to, to go from your home dial-up to your university T1 line was <laughs> and yeah, insane. Um, also, at this time, uh, emulation had started becoming a thing. Uh, Nicholas Samora, I, probably butchering his name, um, started MAME, the MAME project. Uh, and MAME, I think, when it started, only supported maybe five games at, from day one, the release, something like that. But I remember that every, every week there would be a new MAME release and you would be passionate to see to see which game had they added to it and you wanted your game to be in it. So the Frogger, uh, I remember uh, Bomb Jack came on it, I was like, oh, Bomb Jack's one of my favorites. And then Double Dragon and they kept expanding, expanding. And every week there was another release and it, 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 as a project it moved forward so fast. And um, back then ROMs were tiny. ROMs were just a few K, uh, just because the games had to be cheaper and memory was expensive, so games were tiny. But there was one machine that had really big ROMs. Uh, who knows what machine had the biggest ROMs back then? Neo the Neo Geo. The king of consoles. Uh, known for having games that were over 100 megabyte, uh, megabits in size, which, which, is, is, which was unheard of back then. But they were the home arcade, the arcade in your home. Um, and ROMs were all of, uh, just huge. Uh, and then the news broke once in emulation that they had cracked Neo Geo emulation. This was insane. It's like now being able to play these new games at home uh, without spending all your all your pennies on these cartridges would cost hundreds of pounds. It was insane. Um, so I can't remember which was the first ROM they dumped. I think Nam 1975, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's not a big, big new game, but it's big enough that it, it, it's bigger than any other console out there. Um, and they would release the New Year games like maybe one a week, one every two weeks. Um, and uh, you'd have to find a mirror to download it from. 
and every week you, you sit on a computer and you wait for a new one to, to drop and then everyone would rush to the computers and download it and just hammer the servers. Well, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that I managed to get infinite, pretty much infinite space on the university server. So I messaged the guys who were releasing the ROMs and said, hey, if you guys want to host the ROMs, I have some web space. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I hosted the, the next release. Uh, so normally it would show four mirrors. And um, they put me down as the first mirror for Super Psychics 3, I think it was, if I remember correctly. And everyone knows when you go to a website to download something, you click on the first link. Um, so that weekend, uh, I managed to crash the whole T1 network in university. <laughs> Because they have never seen that much traffic ever, ever. Because you know, obviously, it's only a 10 meg website. Who's mm. going to how much traffic they're going to hit? Yeah, hosting Neo Geo ROMs from university wasn't a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry for that segue, mm. but that's, that's a fun story uh, regarding emulation. Um, but yeah, so onwards, programming. Uh, so these are the tools of a Game Boy programmer. No Cash GMB by Martin Korth. It was uh, by far the best Game Boy emulator out there at the time. It was written in assembly language, it was super fast. It had a built-in debugger, a VRAM viewer. You can see the graphics, see the tiles, uh, see everything in it. Um, and it let you do stuff that no other Game Boy emulator could do. It could do multiple Game Boys at once. So you could literally run 16 Game Boys at the same time and link them all together, have them running together. And it was insane. No other Game Boy emulator came close to that. Um, uh, it was worth definitely worth your Twenty dollars, I believe it was to register. Shareware, love shareware. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so yeah, as you saw earlier, I had learned C, and roughly at the same time, uh, Michael Hope and Pascal Felber had released GBDK, which is Game Boy Development Kit, uh, out to the, the masses, uh, which is a C compiler, um, and that suited me fine because I didn't know an assembly language at the time, and everyone else who was making Game Boy games back then were writing them in assembly language, and the barrier to entry for assembly language is quite high. Um, but to be honest, I did learn some assembly language because when you're that close to the hardware of the Game Boy, you need to learn some assembly language. And the GBDK compiler let you uh, do inline assembly. So anything that was slow, I would take it out, rewrite it in assembly language. Uh, and then we have GBTD and GBMB, which is Game Boy Tile Designer and Game Boy Map Builder by Harry Mulder. These are the tools to make the graphics you can put in your game uh, with this tool set and then you start making gamer games. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned Jetpack earlier, from 1983, uh, from Ultimate Play the Game, uh, that was the first thing I pretty much wrote. First game I wrote was a clone, uh, it's called Jetpack DX in, on the Game Boy Color. Um, you can still download now, it's, it's, <laughs> I think nearly every single emulator that came out afterwards used my ROM as uh, that showcase ROM. Uh, we entered it into the Bung Cody competition and became second just about, that was frustrating. <laughs> Should have won that one. Um, but anyway, um, but it did mean uh, that people saw it and people were aware of what I was doing and I got offered a job to make Game Boy games. Uh, so I quit university. So I got hired to make uh, Revolt uh, for the Game Boy. Uh, I don't know, does anyone know what Revolt is? A couple of people know Revolt. Um, so it was a game where you were just little RC cars and you drove around tracks, life-size tracks, and uh, mm -hmm. it was on PC, Dreamcast, N64, PlayStation 1, I think. Mm. Um, we were uh, contracted to do the Game Boy port. It went pretty far. We had six months to make it in. Um, we got to month six. I think we were a month behind. Um, but, um, and then they pulled the project. So that was tough. We took the game um, and retooled it for something else as a, as a demo. Um, one of the other contracts we got was to make <laughs> Game Boy versions of Equestria 2001 and Mary King's <laughs> Riding Star. These two <laughs> wonderful horse riding games. <laughs> I know nothing about horse riding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which was uh, the better game? <laughs> I, I, uh, so, so Mary King Rhinestar, they pitched it as, as more like a Tamagotchi sort of look after your mm. horse sort of thing, but also with some riding stuff 
built in. Yeah. Whereas Equestria has some very serious dressage and, and all this stuff. <laughs> all these words I should not know, <laughs> but I now know because of making this game. Um, uh, yeah, we had a, 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 had a go at it. Um, again, this is one of the ones where they just pulled the plug because uh, either it was taking too long or it just wasn't good enough. I, oh, so we can't play them? But... We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, after flicking around a bit, uh, we managed to pull this license, um, Lego Stop Rally, on the Game Boy, which is uh, a port of the PC and I'm going to say PlayStation 1 game. So yeah, we got to do this, which is really cool. Um, I love Lego. Who doesn't love Lego, really? So um, uh, to make this game was wonderful. I made this amazing game. So the, the idea of this game was actually you build tracks, you build your own tracks and then you race around it in a sort of uh, slot machine style. So it's only one button and you zoom around it, it follows the track, but obviously depending on how fast you go, you either fly off the track or you stay on it. It also had weapons. Um, I made a cool physics system where the car would power slide around corners and everything like that, and they told me to pull it out because it was too much. Uh, they wanted to dumb it down even further and the car just stuck on the track like glue. <laughs> and if you went too fast, it spun out. So that was frustrating. Um, but yeah, the project was going well. Um, yeah, we, I, made a, I made a track designer. Uh, I, I made tools to make the tiles because the game was getting bigger and bigger and we wanted all these Lego tile sets in it and it was just getting crazy out of, out of just huge project. Bear in mind, all I've ever made before this lot is Jetpack DX and that was my mm -hmm. first Game Boy game. So I was a little bit in over my head, um, but I tried my best. Um, it was getting more and more intense. Uh, I was working from home originally, but then with deadlines coming up, they shipped me up to Leamington Spa. I stayed in the Airbnb and pretty much programmed, I don't know, 12 hours a day um, making, working on this game because we had to hit milestones. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about mental health and crunch being a bad thing, but back then, it's just what you did. You had to get the game out on time. Um, um, I was the only programmer on the project. Uh, I wasn't being managed very well, so I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just putting my head down and working on the game, which unfortunately meant I burned out and I crashed and burned uh, about a couple of months before the end of the project, which means the game got released, but my name's not in the credits, oh. which is frustrating. Um, if you go to, it used to be about.com and used to show games, like the early page used to have my name in the credits because it was, it was, it was pre-coming. And then I don't know what day it was, but one day they updated the page and it had someone's name in it. So obviously somebody paid someone to finish it off and it wasn't me. So that was frustrating, but um, that's part of my bar burnout. And as, as I said before, I left game making for about nine years before starting the subject and coming back to game making. Um, little side note. Uh, so if you remember uh, Revolt uh, got pulled and it was quite near the end, to be honest. Um, we retooled it to ATV racing. We put some uh, quad bikes in it, uh, redid the tracks and some new graphics. Um, and obviously, I had left the company by then, so I didn't know what happened to it. And, and in, uh, maybe f a few years ago, I realized, I found mm. out that they actually had released the game. So there was a game out there with my code in it. Of, of, again, my name's not on these, any of these games. Uh, ATV racing and race time are my game engine. Um, they look very similar because they are the same game, <laughs> just dim <laughs> graphics. And this one is closer to AV re uh, to Revolt because it actually has the same arrow and uh, acceleration graphics. Uh, this was a completely new system uh, updated for system version. Uh, for those who don't know, Data, Data Electronics, who made the action replay, amongst other things, uh, did a small run of games called Rocket Games. These were unlicensed Game Boy games. Uh, if you wanted to do a game game originally, you had to have uh, lic be licensed by Nintendo. Uh, the logo that comes down when you start up is a, is a, is a checksum that checks uh, if it's an official game, and you can only get that if you're licensed by Nintendo. Otherwise, it's a breach of copyright and many other things. Uh, but Daytel was smart enough to circumnavigate this uh, checksum and have the game still run. So hence how the, data, uh, the action replay works. So they released a bunch of games. These range between. 10 pounds and 15 pounds, I believe. 10, 15 pounds for the double pack and 10 pounds for an individual game. There's a bunch of them there. There's a website uh, that chronicles all these games. And so, yeah, it's just 
amazing just to, for to me to find out that these games were actually out and these are part <laughs> of uh, my history. I still have flashcard with the demo ROM for ATV Racing that we showed to places saying, hey, do you want to buy our game? Um, but yeah, I never knew what happened to it and it came out, which is cool. All right, uh, so that's the slideshow part of it. The next part is hands-on. Um, so about six months ago, I managed to find all my source code for my Game Boy stuff, which was uh, interesting. Um, so um, I'm not sure how to, uh, how do I do this? Um, so this emulator here is BGB. Uh, it's very similar to um, No Cash Game Boy in that it has a, a VRAM viewer. You can set debugging points and stuff like that. So that's very cool. Um, it's a lot more modern. Uh, it's not cooler. Uh, so this is Jetpack DX, which is the uh, game that got me recognized and a job. <laughs> So, if you all know Jetpack, obviously you have to build this little rocket, uh, avoid the bad guys, then fuel the rocket, and make it to the next point. Um, there's only four baddies in this, because otherwise it screens very, a lot more cramped than the Spectrum version. So you can see here, this is the, on the right side, this is the tile set. These are all the tiles used in the game, which is cool. Uh, so I said every uh, piece of the Game Boy uh, graphics is, is, is made in, with tiles. Uh, everything is an 8x8 pixel tile. So you can see uh, the map here. This part is the same as this part and this part. Um, this part and this part and this part. Uh, this mist effect here, uh, which you can see uh, when I pause it scrolls, uh, not because I've, not because uh, I had that many tiles, it's just these tiles here, if I unpause it, you can see I actually update the tile data to make it scroll. So the coloured tiles ones are in use at the moment? Um, they're the ones that have colour attached to it, but okay. it doesn't always work correctly <laughs> in the emulator, turn it off, make it easier. So um, you can see here's the OAM, which is the the sprites. Um, when we fill the screen up full of stuff, let's unpause that. So you can see these are baddies. So each baddie is made up with four sprites. Um, How is it easy to see this? Yeah, okay. um, and that your hero is made up with four sprites. Also, you can see he has uh, the Three tiles on this side are one palette, and this helmet is done in another palette. So it gives a bit of color. You can see in the palettes, the Game Boy is split into eight palettes. Uh, eight palettes for the backgrounds, and eight palettes for the color uh, for the sprites. Um, but yeah, I just remembered. I didn't want to start here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let me let me rewind a little bit. Um, so. This is um, C car, known as Crap Car. <laughs> um, and Crap Car was the, uh, when the guy offered me the job uh, to make Game of Games, the, obviously they, they had gotten the license for Revolt and they wanted to make a racing game. So they asked me, can you make a racing game? I'm like, I don't know, can I? Um, so I knocked this up in an, an evening, I believe. Um, you can see the window here is 20 by, uh, 18 tiles, as I said before, this is the part you can see in the game. The full window is this, which is the map for the game. That's 32 by 32 tiles. Um, the little car is these two sprites. Um, I'm using 8 by 16 sprites, so they're taller than they are uh, wide. 
And you can see as I move around the window, I don't know if you can see that, should follow me around. Uh, it's really hard to, I should look at my screen. Oops. There we go. Uh, who recognizes the, the shape of the track? Super Sprint. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Level one from Super Sprint. They didn't say they wanted originality, they wanted something that worked. <laughs> So, yeah, as you can see, everything's made up of squares. Uh, we have a little sand tile that slows you down. We had a little uh, tunnel tile that, so you can go behind it. Uh, we had these little tires, some bricks. Um, and that was enough to get me a job. So made it one afternoon. <laughs> That's quite cool. Um, what he should have said is like, That's cool and all that, but can you actually make a game? So, so on the back of Jetpack DX and this, he gave me a job to make a port of Revolt. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking back now, that's probably a little unbalanced. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess I was cheap, and um, <laughs> that's what matters back then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so how much money they can make. Um, again, we did pretty well, and um, who wants to see how far we got with Revolt? Yeah. Um, so no one's ever seen this Ooh. outside of people who made this. Uh, nope, that's one one. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Revolt. No, I need to find a version that doesn't crash. Because um, ah. it started crashing near the end. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Mm, 3.16? Let's try 3.16. Cross your fingers. So the, I took the music from uh, Jetpack DX just to. Sh that's placeholder music. Um, this is gonna crash. I know it. So we got the cars in. I don't know how people well know people. People know Revolt. I know. Only a few people put their hand up. But you choose your RC car. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm playing a slightly earlier version. Because <laughs> maybe not three one six. Oh no, Power 316 is the one I want to show. Okay, uh, let's pick a car. That's a red one. You can see how I move the tracks between uh, the tra screen transitions. Uh, you got the various different uh, levels. You made a bunch of them. Again, this guy, game was like, I would say, a couple of months out of finishing. Um, there are all the bugs that I put in it because I wasn't a great programmer. <laughs> uh, let's try. Toy Town 1? Why not? <laughs> Maybe we've done the sound off, shall we? Uh, sound channel. Sound. F5678. <laughs> solid, solid, solid stuff. Ooh. Uh, only small dogs can hear you. Uh, <laughs> let's turn also off. So you can actually see the 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 the, the panel at the bottom looks exactly like the panel they've used in uh, the race time. Um, forwards. Here we go. So you can see on the right hand side um, that I load in the bits that need loading in as we get nearer to them. Wow, I haven't seen this level in a long time. So, um, my biggest problem with this game was the scale of the tracks. They were too big. Um, I tried to explain this to the level designer, i.e. my boss, and he just wanted, didn't want to uh, listen to me. <laughs> That's cool enough. Um, yeah, you run around that. This does level doesn't have any weapons. I'm gonna get some weapons. Try them, them one. But yeah, this is the first time people are seeing Revolt outside of the development phase. Um, I don't know what do people think. Would people have bought this with a Game Boy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it would have been surprised after playing Revolt. Let's be honest. Yeah, Micro Machines meets. Um, yeah, that's what it feels like. Super, supercars. If, if we're playing supercars, 
Yeah, so that's kind of the feel we're going for. What weapons did you have though? Uh, we had all of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, literally, we literally, we managed to get all of them in. Uh, well, I say we, I mean me. Uh, <laughs> let's reset that, hold on. Uh, me, two artists, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was three of us, um, and we were outsourcing audio to uh, whoever would do it for us. And when you say Cheap. port, were you just kind of cloning it? You did? Did you have access to the original oh, no, yeah. or code or anything? Not, no, no, not code. Literally, yeah. So, so you just that, had a license to you to write a game that looked like Revolve. Yeah. So it's how, how it was done in the old days. It's like you didn't yeah. have the source code. You literally had the original game. You'd play it to death. You'd yeah. learn other bits, and then you would hopefully make a fatal transition, a translation of it to mm. it. So, uh, I know that's how they did R-Type, that's how they did Commando. Yeah. Um, they've all talked about that. Like this, you, you ha If you're lucky, you'd get a, maybe a, a videotape of someone playing the whole game through. If you're really unlucky, you'd be, the game would be too hard and you would not know <laughs> what comes after level four. <laughs> and that happened more than, more than you'd think. Um, uh, sometimes coders would... Uh, purposely nerf the game so you couldn't get it past level four because there was no game after yeah. level four. <laughs> or they would make up their own levels. Um, mm. I've seen that happen a lot in a lot of the arcade ports. <laughs> uh, slow down, come back. Oh, let's reverse. So yeah, oh, oh there's, some, there's some power ups there. Let me, let me get those. Uh, come. Oh, yeah, well. uh, here we go. So yeah, look, ch check out the animation on that. So m my boss was the artist. Uh, he's a decent artist, uh, I guess. Um, just a rubbish boss, but <laughs> I'm not better. Um, weapons, how, what button is it? That one. Oh, oh. that button crashes it, apparently. <laughs> but that level does remind me of the first level of Rebo. Yeah, exactly. That, that, um, like yeah, Toys in the Hood. Yeah. So uh, we tried to get the levels feeling as close as possible to the original game. Oh, there's a bomb here. Does that work? Oh, no. I'm, I'm, oh, no, it's not good. Not good. It's not good. Oh, this <laughs> okay, so that what weapon does that. That blows yourself up. Um, there's no button to drop your weapon. So, like, if you, if you, I don't know where I'm going. So, this is one of the problems with big, giant, sprawling maps. You have no idea where you're going. And there's like no, no, no place mocking. So, this is the giant ball. Um, does, will this work? Oh, that kind of worked. Not really. Kind of not quite. <laughs> Who designed these levels? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> it's horrendous. You should, you should play this on stream and see how frustrated you can get. But yeah, so that's Revolt. Oh yeah, so I want to show you um, riding style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Horse riding games. No. Yes. <laughs> so I found out a little while ago also the anime box art on this range of games um, Larry Bunny Jr. did the graphics artwork for it um, which I didn't know about at all uh, so yeah this is um, the start of <laughs> American writing style <laughs> so again you had to just reverse engineer this yeah, this wasn't this wasn't even reverse engineering. This was like make a game, <laughs> right? Vaguely uh, inspired by inspired by this. Yeah, it's like okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I wish they did though. So, <laughs> so um, let, let's let's uh, do some dressage, shall we? Yeah. Uh, is that the B button? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so your horse can, can, can trot, it can do uh, various other um, speeds. So a trot, I believe, is two taps, a walk to trot. So you have to follow these dots as you trot. Halt, coming up. Halt, salute, hello. Is there a just Hello. Immediately all the Oh, error, of course. Ah. I should say error off course, course. not yeah. of course. <laughs> so yeah. Um, oh wait, no. Oh, oh, come back. Oh, so I'll go horribly wrong now. I need to be trotting. There we go. We're trotting now. <laughs> so she did a T in the bottom right corner. That's the speed we're going at. Oh, shot corner. Oh, 
<laughs> so this is dressage, apparently. I'm going to loop the loop. So, you know, even if we had finished this game, I don't see <laughs> how this is in any way fun <laughs> for anyone. Right, this is amazing. <laughs> don't understand why they didn't release it. <laughs> to be honest, this wasn't far off the PC port. Right. So we took this level from uh, Equestria 2001, the dressage level on that. Um, I can see so many things wrong with this. Um, <laughs> How long do you have to do this for? <laughs> I don't remember, to be honest. How much of your life was making this game? <laughs> uh, whatever it was, it was too long. Um, but yeah, we had to make the money somehow, so we were mm. working on this while we were... Oh, oh, oh. oh. you're off course. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, of course, hold on, hold on. You can actually you can see that, this is cool. So you can see that the horse is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven sprites. No, eight sprites. Eight sprites for the horse, I remember. Yeah, eight sprites of the horse and four sprites. Actually, not that eight for the rider. A ridiculous amount of sprites for this. Okay. Uh, what am I doing? I'm walking next. Okay, let's walk. <laughs> this is riveting. <laughs> this is, it's meant the best let's plays. So, did you finish this and it wasn't released, or did you? Oh uh, no, it, the, the 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 like this was, I guess, the. Uh, what do you call it? A test we made yeah. for them. And um, I, I guess they decided it wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm trotting, I'm trotting. Quite a random question. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that it was uh, published by Midas. Yes. Uh, who are notorious for making the world's shittest games ever. Yes. I'm wondering what happened, like how did they approach you? Because I, I, I would love to know, like they have so many, no, I'm not saying, I mean this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did they approach you and say, look, here's next to no money, what can you do this? To be honest, I don't know. I, I, I didn't work on that part thing. I just coded. Uh, that was all down to my lustrous boss who uh, got the deals. Which one's Canada? Um, but I, I would assume they shopped around developers and trying to find people to make games for as little to no money as possible, which, which I guess fits uh, what we were doing. <laughs> Did you try, like, do you try and make it a good game? Or were you like, this is going to be shared over here? No, I, I, um, I think for this, I just did what I was told. Because okay. um, I didn't know what to do to for make a horse riding game. Like, we had a this criteria to make. They gave us a, a design document and everything. It had to uh, do all these things, have dressage and stuff like that. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> I finished. <Yay! laughs> um, so yeah, uh, yeah. We, did, we, had a, we had a design document, and we told we had to do these things. Had to have these elements in it. And what can you do? You make the best game you can with what you have. And I've never done any sort of horse riding before in my life. I, I don't know not. I know like, yeah, absolutely nothing about horse riding. So uh, neither did my boss. So we kind of made it up as we went along. We played the PC version, which was horrendous anyway, <laughs> and. Um, be much better than that. Uh, let's go have a look at the courtyard. So it's a nice little courtyard. This, this, so this is where you would go to um, sell to ghost horse riding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to look after your horse. Yeah, so a little paddock and stuff. I guess you can go around and around here. Um, not much going on. It's just a map. Um, actually, these graphics are done by my brother. So um, those of you know, I am making a game at moment with my brother called Mau Mau Castle. Uh, he's the artist on that. Uh, back then, I got my brother to do some graphics for graphics, uh, the company I was with. And these are the ones he did, quite mm -hmm. cute. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's, that's riding style. Um, what are you supposed to do in that courtyard? Um, look after your horse. That's as far as we got. Uh, <laughs> so there's gonna be a horse brushing simulator or something, yeah, you, you is it? Yeah, you feed it, you brush it, you, 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 you tammy got you up your uh, horse. So I made a little leg of face. Uh, you can edit tracks <laughs> so later on you can drive van tracks, but this is earlier on. Um, the driving did work. 
Um, but for whatever reason, this emulator doesn't like what I've done to the game. Um, and I haven't had time to go through and work out why it doesn't work. It does still work in cartridge, I believe. But hey, let me show you the, the track editor. Uh, this one. So you get various different road pieces. Actually, this is way back. Let's get a little bit further on. Um, so a 2000 Lego group. Yeah. Construction race. New. So yeah, this is a blank uh, Lego board. You can see the numbers up at the top and the side. I don't know why we chose that palette, but um, <laughs> that's the one we chose. Um, then you press select and it'll take you to the uh, uh, piece picker. See all these little buildings? They're quite cute. And then you can push down, you can some side pieces, crates, and some big giant rocket. Oh, yeah, every zone had a, a giant piece. And this was uh, the rocket. And then we had roll pieces. So let's pick a piece, let's pick on that. Um, that button, yeah. So A to place. Um, let's pick up, that's a slight line, because that one knows. Then that one. And you press B for the last piece you used. B to rotate. Ooh, no, pick that piece up, that piece. Um, it takes a while to get used to how this works, but with a Game Boy with four buttons, you don't have much choice. Mm. You can see the, the, the legend at the bottom tells you what happened. So I press B for pick the last piece I used, which was a corner. I press B again to rotate it, and A to place it down. And same again, so last, rotate, place, rotate, place. And I hit start, and you can preview it. Oh, let's, let's put something in the middle, shall we? It's probably nice, let's, let's get the rocket. There we go. Uh, that one, let's write that in there. And uh, let's get, uh, that's got a camera, <laughs> a church or something, I don't know, that's, that's, that's a little house. Let's put some houses here. There we go. And then uh, you can preview that. Can you see? There's the houses. You can see the loader uh, loads in chunks as it needs them. For a Game Boy game, that's pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah. So did you have like lots of Lego to use as reference? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So I had to write a towel uh, compressor because um, originally these were all just giant bit bitmaps and, and they just took up too much memory. So I had to go through and find similar tiles and I wrote a tool that did that and also um, worked out if it was another palette, it could be the same tile or it could be rotated. So it just did a big crunch and it just squashed all the files um, and then optimized the whole thing. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a tools programmer by, by any means, but that was one of the first things I programmed. And it's quite a nice thing. It's, it's quite cool. Um, you can play this, uh, the cartridge is around somewhere. Um, and it's an okay game, but it's a kid's game. The racing is mm -hmm. no fun, to be honest. Um, at Scale Electric, you can drive either on the left side of the track or the right side of the track and swap between them, but you can't spin out like I wanted to do. It has no, has no inertia. It literally, you're glued to the track. Uh, there are other bad guys stuff, um, but it, it's, it's a bit meh. Uh, could have been a better game, but obviously I got pulled off the project as I burned out. When you were making these games, was the only way for you to test some device to like burn on like a flash cartridge and put the flash cartridge in there? Yeah, exactly that. So yeah, you would generally do stuff by emulator, uh, no cash Game Boy, and then when you wanted to test on the game cartridge, you get your parallel port or cable and plug it into your flasher uh, and then plug the cartridge in. Uh, it take a little, a few seconds to flash and then put into Game Boy and then you test it on the real Game Boy itself and then you'd see. Uh, they didn't work, and then you cry and make some changes, <laughs> and then you do it all over again. Um, but yeah, you, you would try to minimize time by going to the cartridge as, as little as possible. Yeah, but definitely wrong on the device, you just had to bear in slow latex and so you worked out what was wrong. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so if you find bits were wrong that were fine on, on, on emulator but not working on the cartridge, it was a, a process of elimination. Um, there are obviously proper tools you can get. Um, IS Systems did a Game Boy debugger and things like that, um, but they're 
thousands of, of, of pounds and my boss wasn't going to pay for those. <laughs> Ways that use a 20 pound emulator. Mm -hmm. um, oh, let me show you. Um, so one of the things we were looking to do while we were um, between projects. Is it on here? Yeah, it's on here. This is Chichi's day. Um, for those of you who have played Bubble Bubble and other games like that, uh, this is sort of my take on Bubble Bubble meets uh, Bomb Jack, I guess. Sample sound. <gasps> <laughs> so, yeah, it's a simple uh, one screen game where you click collect uh, these coins, I guess they are. Uh, while baddies uh, chase you and you have to shoot them and you can kick them off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can jump and obviously, uh, yeah. What? So this would have been a game if we had found someone to pick it up and, and, and sell it to. But I think it's quite cute. And I think, oh, geez. and at the time there wasn't much. Uh, there wasn't many games on the Game Boy in this mold. You had Bubble Bubble, uh, I think by then Parasol, Parasol Stars were out by then. But this is quite, would have been quite a cool Ooh. game. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I didn't know how to do music on the Game Boy, so that's why we always outsourced it. Um, but I didn't know how to do sampled sound. So uh, anything we demoed, I put sample sound in because it's just it's quite funny. Um, when I said I was the only programmer, there was actually one other guy we hired back at Craig, uh, very talented guy actually, um, and uh, they had him working on a completely different project for me. He was working on a shoot 'em up um, project X, which was pretty cool. Um, was it absolute X? Which one the one? Also another Midas game. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So I would say he was a better programmer than I was. Uh, so this is debug menu. Select can't die. That'll do. <laughs> you can't die. That's good. <clears throat> Nobody wants to die. So yeah, vocal shoot up. Again, mm. there weren't too many vocal shoot ups, I guess, on the Game Boy. They were mainly like one screen games or uh, platformers. Uh, again, my brother did a lot of graphics on this. And this would have been cool. I don't know if this ever came out. I don't think it did. Did Binance ever release this? Who knows? But you can see again, uh, as it scrolls, they draw in the level as you need it, roll by mm -hmm. roll. It's quite nice to see, you can see the sprites. Um, oop, oop. Come on. Sprites. Smart bumps. Oh, it's a boss fight. Oh. Okay, I'm invincible, it's fine. This is quite a cool game. Um, yeah, this is never released. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Project S11 on the Game Boy. It's an amazing shoot 'em up for Game of Color. Uh, one of the very few. I think I have it with me. It's, yeah. But this is also what we were doing. The, 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 but I feel like if we were managed better and we had some tra actual training, um, things would work a lot better. So what actually happened to graphic state in the end? I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, 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 I literally was, I was burned so badly that I walked away from it and mm -hmm. so you've, right. didn't want to know anything about them ever again. Um, I believe they made some Game Boy Advance games. They did the port Crazy Taxi, I think, Game Boy Advance, if oh, I remember right. correctly. Um, they made, made some cool stuff. Um, I don't know, obviously, which programmers they hired after me, mm -hmm. but they did make some cool stuff. Uh, just not when I was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
games. But um, like I said, I've, I've recently found my Game Boy uh, code, uh, game, my Game Boy source code again, which has been wonderful. Um, and I've seen other people still making Game Boy games, which is great to see. Um, uh, there's videos out there and stuff. And uh, I think once I finish making Mama Castle, I'm gonna go back to making Game Boy games. Oh, um, I feel that there is still a market to make Game Boy games physical cartridges. People are willing to pay money for Game Boy games. Um, uh, I'm definitely a better programmer than I was. I'm a better game designer than I was. Um, so I think we can make some cool stuff. Um, so yeah, watch this space. Hey. Well, Mama Castle, what are you writing that for? So Mama Castle is coming out on mobile primarily. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to do a itch.io release because um, it's going to be a free game. Uh, we want everyone to play it. Um, it's our love letter to Space Harrier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like Space Harrier, Harrier meets uh, Never Ending Story <laughs> uh, meets uh, Crazy Cat Rainbows. <laughs> so. So how, do you, how do you find writing modern games compares with your experiences uh, here? So yeah, writing modern games is easier in some way in, in that I don't have to worry about how much CPU power I have, how much space left on the cartridge. Um, I don't have to worry about the limitations of the system. But on the other hand, I actually really miss that. The, the limitations yeah. is, is actually part of the fun of creating uh, the games. Um, I've taken a lot of my mentality of making game games along with modern games in that I now um, optimize as I, as I go along. Whereas I've seen other people's code and, and games and it's horrendous. They'll just hmm. layer stuff on top of other stuff. Um, I, not, not get me wrong, I've got a little bit lazy in, t in terms of like if, if some, I'm rushing, I'll just whack things on and the CPU will handle it. Yeah. Whereas on the Game Boy, you literally had to worry about every single byte and, 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 and cycle, uh, machine cycle you had. Um, so yeah, it's, it's mm. e definitely easier and it gives you more freedom. But equally, I can see the temptation of going back to writing for the Game Boy and those restrictions are part of the challenge then, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think definitely restrictions breed the creativity. Um, I'm a big yeah. fan of doing game jams, which are, which are usually like 48 hours to make a game. And there's those 48 hours that, that, that really um, test your metal and really um, make you use your creativity. Um, Mau Mau Castle was creating a game jam. We made mm. it within a week. Uh, it won best game, best graphics, best music. Best overall, yeah, best overall game, uh, uh, a game jam uh, in Sweden called Castle Game Jam. And when's it out again? Oh, so when's it out? That's always the question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, soon is, 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 is the word I gave. Oh, I'm not holding you to anything. Uh, just on yeah, there. soon. Uh, actually, at, at the moment, we're looking at releasing in August this year. Um, we are going to be at Gamescom showcasing, and I promised the guys at Gamescom that I would bring them a finished game. <laughs> so. Uh, no matter where we are at winning August, I'm going to package it up yeah. and get it out there. Oh, you can always patch later, can't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>